Cool. Okay, so uh, my name is Lofa Kramer. Uh, I represent Why Not Free. Why Not Free is a charity organization where we focus on work life balance for overachievers. So that is who I represent. So, a little bit of background about me. I was actually in Elsa, a member. I studied law in Belgium. And when I studied law, I started a company called Lightning Video Editors. Uh, with that company, we grew now to two countries, Benelux, and we've been active in 25 countries for the past two years. Uh, and the reason I'm in Rotterdam is because we have our main offices here since two years ago now. So I started that company to fund my law school. Uh, successfully, I graduated and then I came here. As I was funding this ginormous thing that it is now, it took a lot of stress to be able to graduate and at the same time run a company that has a team of now 14 people. And that took its toll. It took its toll to the, to the point where my sleep was really bad, my food was really bad, uh, my stress levels got really bad. Uh, at the age of 17, I already had gray hair. So, um, so all of those issues popped up in such an extent that doctors, when I explained things like symptoms that were out of the ordinary, things like I was diagnosed with chronic hyperventilation, so every time my stress levels get too high, my breathing gets really bad. So doctors, traditional medicine, if you go to a doctor, couldn't really save me. So that kind of put me on the path of self-discovery to other alternative things. Uh, in the beginning, and that's what I talked about at TEDx Rotterdam, in the beginning it was things like really alternative medicine, like there would be guys that I would meet that pick up Celtic coins in the forests of Germany. Uh, they taught me the purpose of home medicine and how I can use tools that we already have to feel better, to, to recover faster. But obviously that wasn't enough. So then I started going the other direction, which is traveling to the US, finding out about biohacking systems, using technology, health technology to, to fast track my recovery there. And all of that knowledge kind of brought me to an extent where I saw suddenly exactly like this, a small group, a conference, I was speaking for, for an organization called ISEC. Uh, and, and we were at this conference, and, and just like you guys are sitting here, I asked them, what do you guys like me, so so how I ended up in that conference, and the agenda manager, the person in charge of the workshop, they told me to do the work-life balance workshop. There was no kind of relevance. It was just a workshop that was lost. The speaker didn't show up for it, and we got it last minute design. So I stood there and I asked these guys, "Look, we're here at a big conference. There are a lot of workshops. This is a random workshop. I do have some experience in it, but." I didn't understand the extent of my experience. So I just literally asked them, what are you struggling with? What, if this was the perfect workshop, what could I solve for you? Make it as personal as possible, because I, I meet a lot of people, and a lot of people ask me, but not a lot of people get the opportunity to really brainstorm with an amazing group. Uh, and it's not just me, it's like all of us together brainstorm about specific problems, specific experiences, together to solve it. At a, at a period of one hour that we have. So that is kind of the background, and that is also kind of the question that I have for you guys. What do you want to talk about? What are you struggling with on the work-life balance scale? And, and if this was the perfect workshop, what would you want me to share or help you with? Any questions so far? Anybody? Not all the parents. Are you guys struggling? So I think that student life is very, it's become very stressful because you have to hold up so many balls on so many levels. I mean, you have to have an internship, you have to have a job next to it because you can't pay for your studies, you have to study for your studies, you have to have social life next to it. And it's, it's a lot of different things. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what stresses most people, especially me, out. It's just, it's completely different from each other. Do you, does everybody feel like this? So, so if we would phrase it in a one sentence kind of thing, what, what is it exactly? How do you balance everything? Yes. That would be the question. Yes. How do you balance all areas of life? Yes. Balance areas. Anybody else? Anybody else? Um, 
So that kind of got figured out. And then what was uh, funny, around that three-year mark, when I actually got to figure that one out, and that's sometimes how the universe works, I started discovering something else, something was lacking with my health. And I started going into this whole story that I just told you about health. So what happened was I met a guy during uh, my social interactions, and, and I wanted to learn how to talk to people. And this guy, uh, so he taught me how to talk to people. And one of his things that he said is that I should read a booklet. And this booklet was by a guy called Kenton Knepper. And, and the booklet was about how to cold read people. So, anybody know what cold reading is? So, what is cold reading? Yeah, I, as far as I know, it's more a technique used by more medium sort of people. And then they look at you and your expressions and yeah. your accessories, anything they pretty much have to figure what sort of a person you are or what is your story? It's exactly like if you've ever seen The Mentalist, it's that. So it's the idea of looking at someone and predicting with science as 80% accuracy of you're pretty much stereotyping. And by stereotyping, sir? Sure? Yeah, exactly that. And so the funny thing is when I actually dive into the science of it all, when you do personality tests, the highest accuracy, the big five, gets it right about 70, 72, or 76%, I don't remember the number exactly. But then when you stereotype people, 
80% of the time you're right. So you're better off stereotyping than taking a personality test. Um, so mentalism is that, exactly. So cold reading is the art of doing mentalism in the popular culture. And this booklet was really easy. It came down to there are three areas to life. As long as you can guess a problem in each of these three areas, you're able to spark a conversation with a person. That was my reasoning why I learned this, to be able to hold a conversation and not have an awkward silence. So when, when I started realizing that I could use this as a conversation tool, I started re realizing that this isn't only to spark problems and have a conversation and everything. I could use this on my life. And I remember I was looking at a, a door where you could write with chalk on. I remember in the corner, I wrote everything down on this door, and I just had the first letters, H-W-R, and they stood for Health, Wealth, Relationships. And I remember I just passed the relationship, it was like a three-year mark, and I was going slowly into health. But I remember looking at it, and I thought, I finally figured this out. Like, I finally have enough money to live, I have enough friends to support me, what's next? And I saw at the door and it was helpful for relationships. And it was just normal help. That was the next thing. So the, the other thing that Kendrick Knuffer said in that booklet is that you have an inner and an external area to it. So when we ask ourselves, how do we balance everything? The first question that needs to pop up, just like I sat there and I looked at my door, what's next? First question we should know is, what should I balance? And so for me, it was very easy to discover because if every and any problem fits into those three areas, we can balance our lives based on those three areas, health, wealth, and relationships. So knowing that there's an internal and an external component makes us a little bit more sane to know where to go with that. So balancing all areas for me was to know that every day I do an activity within my health, within my relationships, and within my wealth, so that I know that at the end of the day, I got the pin a little bit closer to being more balanced. And, and the idea then I started actually reading in more. A year, it was years later, I think, I discovered a book, an old book by Aristotle's, um, it's pronounced the title right, it's, I think it's Nicomachean Ethics. But in there, yeah, that one. So in that book he describes that happiness is an activity that pretty much summed up health, wealth, and relationships, and success, and all these other words to be used, but it sums up health, wealth, and relationships. But he said, and that's the interesting part, it's an activity. So just like that guy I met and that referred me to Ken Temper, he also said every day he does something for health, wealth, and relationships. So here suddenly you have a fulfilled day, and our students 2,000 years ago already knew that and described it as uh, eudaimonia. So you have hedonism, which is you buy something, you feel really good, and then you have eudaimonia, the state of happiness. It's not happiness, it's a state. Once you accomplish an activity and you maintain that activity, you get into a state of bliss, state of happiness. And for me, very practically, because I'm a practical person, for me that's looking in the mirror and knowing that I've accomplished what I need to accomplish and I'm happy with my life. So when people ask me, am I happy? The answer is just yes, because I'm in that activity constantly. So now I know health, wealth, and relationships. I start looking at my day daily, but also weekly, to see whether I've done enough. And so one of those shortcuts and hacks that I created was called the silent day. Every Sunday, I plug out completely. No electronics, no people, it's silent, I don't talk to anybody. And then I just look. Have I done everything within health, wealth, and relationships that week? And usually for me, because I'm an introvert, I would lack on the relationship side. So out of my silent day around 5 or 6 o'clock, I would plug out. The first thing I would do on my to-do list is call people that I love. And that way, even though it's not every day, I still accomplish a good week within helpful relationships and have kind of improved those relationships without them watering down. So bringing it back to your context, does that kind of answer it, or do you want to go make the connection with your situation? Um, yeah, so I guess you think that if I would use like the health, uh, wealth, and relationships, uh, should I have to cut out things that I think don't fit into those things? Yeah, so the next part of that, and that's if we have really long workshops, I do that. Uh, so when I realized that we had help of relationships, 
there's a maximum to what you can do. And so the next part, the way I learned it, it's called many other things now, but I learned it as the Warren Buffett method. And the idea of the Warren Buffett method is that you should set goals. And so ideally, you would want goals in health or in relationships to keep yourself balanced. And then I, I remember I looked at it and it said you need to have a max of three goals, else you can't really become productive in each area. I didn't even make it up, so it was just like three goals. So I was like, okay, the word book is this goal, so let me do it better. So I started off with like six goals that completely didn't work, so I quickly cut it out to five goals. And goals would be for me something like working on my relationship with my girlfriend, that's one. Working at the time of my law school, working at a job, and being good at it so I can get promoted, uh, being in a um, student organization, uh, building my business, whatever, going to the gym, that was also one thing. And so what I started realizing is that when I was doing all of that, I was doing okay, but I wasn't outperforming people. So I was going to the gym, but it was like barely scraping by, had barely energy, so I just like would walk in, do the bare essentials, and walk away. And then I realized that like I wasn't growing, I was just going through the motions. So I started cutting out the gym and saw what happened, and suddenly got a little bit better, still not maintainable. And so then I started realizing what if I cut out like, you know, less relationships, I would do less social stuff. Or I would start cutting on on specific things like student organizations. I started realizing that the moment I had three goals, I wasn't too spread out. And suddenly I could do much more. To the point where it went crazy. So I started focusing more on my business. Lighting video just grew to the point where we start scaling really fast. I think within a couple of months, Coca Cola became our client. Just because I started focusing, my grades went up, uh, my relationship went much better. Before it was just really complicated to balance everything. So, and then what I realized is around exam period, obviously all your focus goes on studying. So suddenly all the others start suffering because this new thing comes in. And then you start realizing that, and you might have noticed that around the exam period, you start cutting out things so that you can focus. So naturally, you guys already know that you have a limited capacity of focus, but you only do it during exams. Imagine you have the same mindset every day for the rest of your life. It's not a new thing, but that's why people kind of advise to follow your passions. It sounds really cliche, but but the reason why they apply to this because you guys have noticed that during the exam period, when you focus down, it's it's an amazing experience for you to flow. But because you're studying something, if you're passionate about it, you'll be super happy. But if you're not, it's just the most horrific time in the world. So if you work in your passion, you focus the same way you focus at an exam, but it's your passion. It's, it brings you energy. It gives you happiness. And, and so this is kind of the Warren Buffett method. So it, the issue with that is that a lot of people don't want to hear that. Because what I'm saying actually is you're either doing okay uh, or you're doing great. But if you want to do greatness, then stuff needs to go out. But here comes again a hack. And again, it's the silent day, which is why I noticed the silent day. So the silent day was for me that shortcuts. I cut out relationships. By the way, you can't cut out like your family, right? So, uh, so my best friends, I wanted to maintain contact. So on the silent day, I would make a to-do list of, hey, I didn't call these people. And, and then I would get out of my silent day, and that's the first thing I would do. And that's how I balanced it. And, and the beauty is that people love that, because they understand that you're busy, and suddenly you make time for them. So suddenly it becomes nice. You're so, that's, that's like the story of like these huge CEOs that have so much to do, but yet they have time to you know, call for hours with their mom. Because it's this principle, uh, okay, you can only do three things, but once a week you can you know, carve out some time to rest and at the same time call somebody you love. So, so for me that was a shortcut within a very focused kind of regimen of six days. And then the seventh day, you know, you would rest and, and I would catch up on everything that I missed out there. So obviously to a certain extent you can only do that. Does it kind of answer? Yes, it does. So the silent day was that shortcut for me, and it got so big and viral that TEDx invited me on my second TEDx speech to just talk about the silent day.
So before, when, when I have chronic hyperventilation, like it would go till five. So I couldn't do a full day because because it's way too busy to completely hook up for an entire day. It would be healthy though. Don't get me wrong. It would be healthy. But for me, it was too much. So five o'clock would be the max. Then from five till six, and I wrote a blog post about it. You can find it online. From five till six, I would cook myself food because the whole week I wouldn't be able to cook. But here on the silent day, so I have time. So one hour I would take to cook and eat. And the beauty of eating, and, and that's actually an, an exercise that a lot of mindful people do. I told you I met those people that you know pick up healthy coins and eat all that stuff. So one of those things they did is mindful eating. It's called. And it's sad that it has to have a name, right? But it's just eating without being on your phone, being on the TV. It's just enjoying your food properly. And then at six o'clock, I would turn on everything, buzzing started, and then normal life came in. And that's how I caught up for work. So that was my silent day. So when it's really stressful, five o'clock. Nowadays, my breathing is fine, as you can see. So I do it till two. So it's just no harm. What, what do you do with the side of the day? You just, you just evaluate me. Like, no, first couple of hours, it's like, if you are constantly on, the first couple of hours, you're not able to do anything. You're just lying in bed like, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, people didn't believe me that I didn't do anything, so I made a vlog about it. It's just like, like sometimes I would go to, like, here, or go to the Erasmus Bridge on a sunny day, and then I sit there for, like, four hours. Of course, you think in the time, right? Well, well, the beauty of when you're constantly on and then you have a silent day is that the first couple of hours, and you might have, I don't know if you've had this, but sometimes you pick up a book and you can't even read it because you can't focus. So that is a sign you should have a silent day. So what happens is on that silent day, suddenly you can be plugged and you can't even think because you're so overstimulated. Around like two, three hours later, you start hearing your first thoughts. That's when you can pick up a book again and start reading. It took me two months to get to the point where I could read a book again. Considering I study a lot, that was a big problem. <laughs> so, so the sad thing I have to go through that. But I literally don't do anything. Sometimes I pick up like a jacket that would go somewhere and I would do nothing there. Just sit or like lie or whatever. And then after two, three hours, you notice you start falling asleep again. Awake, awake, sleep, awake. It's a super weird experience. Then around two, three hours, once you're like completely deep plugged start hearing your thoughts again, you can read a book again. I might pick up a book or something or I would reflect. I would create a circle, three circles on our banners. Why not three? You would see three circles, health, wealth, relationships. I would write down on there what I do. Then it would always be wealth, so much stuff, relationships, like two things, and then health, zero. So it's like I would restructure my week. So yeah, nowadays, because I've done it so many times, it's I don't need to write it down anymore. I'm very stressful weekly. But now it's just in my head when I reflect. I'm like, okay, oh, I didn't do this, didn't do that. In the beginning, I used to write everything. I have banners, and flip charts, and fees. I'm going to ask you, how many hours do you sleep during a week? Uh, so that was really interesting for me because uh, when I started out, I used to sleep 10, 11 hours. And so how I started on this biohacking journey is because I didn't understand why. That wasn't, like, didn't seem to be healthy to sleep 10 hours. Which every expert that I talked to, they would say, oh, that means your body needs this, and then you have to sleep. That was their answer. There was no answer. So when I went on this biohacking journey, I went to a conference in Florida. And I started realizing that the reason I sleep 10 hours is because my body needs it. But the reason my body needs it is because I was eating the wrong things. So because I was eating specific things that my body can tolerate, I was sleeping 10 to 11 hours. So the first step was kind of cutting out all the bad food. And the moment I cut out the bad food, automatically I started sleeping around 7 to 8 hours. For me, that wasn't enough. And the reason why is there's a research that was done, one of the biggest we've had in the world, where they looked at people that had eight hours of sleep, people that had five hours of sleep, and six and a half. And the conclusion of that, which maybe isn't the best conclusion, is that the eight hour people, you know, they die faster, so it's less healthy. Five hours to live longer than eight hours, but not as optimal as six and a half. So they kind of established six and a half is the best time to sleep. But if your body needs sleep, like you can't just suddenly 
set an alarm and then wake up after six and a half hours. So what that meant, and that was, I think, that's the conclusion I took, uh, which was kind of followed by the biohacking community. That meant that your optimal flow for a body should actually be to six and a half hours. So if you're not sleeping six and a half hours, you're doing something wrong. So when I started putting out foods that were bad, started reintroducing, finding out which were the best, started supplementing, I started doing blood tests every, in the beginning it was like every month, but that would compare to my mentors, that's why I didn't do it every week. And then now it's like every three months I do them to double check that everything is in check. Um, I switched specific diets and went more high fat, uh, so high good fat, uh, away from carbs, and those kind of things are contributing to me being able to sleep six and a half, seven hours. And so sometimes, you know, it's work life balance. I go eat a pizza and then I sleep for nine hours. Uh, but sleep is very important. Yes. And because you, you told me that when you uh, when you have your silent day and then in the morning you're like, oh, where am I? I also have that, but it's only if I haven't slept like the whole week. Yeah. You know, then, then I really can't function anymore and I can really see it and I can really sit down somewhere and I can just zone out completely. Yeah, and that's only what that really... <laughs> no, <Yeah>. I <laughs> try to get my sleep in. The only uh, issues I have sleeping is so conferences. So the conference I actually started this whole thing at, the conference where I gave the first one of free workshop, that was a conference that was five days long. I had to speak every day. I slept two hours a night. So when I get into those situations, which is quite often actually, uh, we go to like the next level of like sleep hacking. And so I have like these tools that like a CES machine, a uh, CES machine, which does electrostimulation to the brain, gets you into specific phases so that you can sleep more efficient. Um, there are things like isochronic tones that are not as well researched, but you know, I believe in placebo. So. Uh, I feel that specific, for specific cases, isochronic tones can work. The research doesn't back it up, which is, I always have to mention that, so test it out yourself. But there are things like isochronic tones, like a SES machine, that actually has some science backing it up. Taking magnesium, there's a supplement called GABA. Obviously, you check with your doctors and everything, but I started researching, finding all these tools. There are things that biohackers do, which is called vitamin stacking. You combine vitamins, get it all together, and then you take it. So, how do you take it in a research manner? I have a law background, so obviously you're going to research this. So, when you take a blood test, you also take a vitamin panel. You ask your doctor, hey, check my magnesium levels, check like these levels, these levels, B, B complex is an important one. So, what I found is when my magnesium levels were low, it was because stress was high and then my sleep was worse. So, if I would supplement with magnesium, my sleep got deeper and I could track it on an app on my iPhone. Before, when I started this whole thing, there weren't apps on the iPhone to check your sleep. So we had these crazy Bluetooth things that I hated because I didn't want Bluetooth next to my head. Uh, but that was like necessary to find out how your sleep was. And then these iPhone sleep trackers came along and I started seeing that the results were almost identical. It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. So then I got away all those Bluetooth things and started going deeper into the sleep trackers and they told me if my Bluetooth was good enough. And so on a conference, when I sleep two hours, I have that SES machine, I take magnesium, GABA, and that gives me kind of the sleep in two, three hours that I would normally get on like six hours. And it kind of gets me through the conference with the same mind. Um, and then you see everybody like on the fourth, fifth day crumbling, completely finished, and then I'm like, hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> so they don't get to have that work, but yeah, that's how I do it. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes. Does that answer that question? Yes. Cool. Then let's continue the next one. Stress, I think that was you. What was that question again? Um, usually just before I'm going to present, I'm going to go to the I'm just physically feeling yeah. like burden. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah, so again, subjective thoughts of what I think that is. I could be wrong. So from my experience with them was whenever I checked with clients uh, that go into really big deals is uh, the, the thing of uncertainty that's stressing you out because I do not prepare my speeches because at this point I know that if I walk in I'll just do the speeches, I'll work out somehow. 
you don't have to prep anymore. So there is actually no stress to speeches. And within exams, what was happening, most of the time for students is you don't know. You don't know if you needed an extra day or five extra days. You just don't know. So you kind of hope it was enough. So when you walk into your exam, that could be something that causes your stress. So once you know that that's the reason, right? So for me, that's how I dealt with it. I realized that was the reason why. So then I started tracking myself. So I had this thing that was an Excel sheet a friend of mine invented called the Having Sheet. So you can Google it. It's still online. It's free. And this, but it's very technical. And he's a coder, so he coded an entire Excel sheet with colors and everything. And, and then you would have your entire day just like literally written down. 8 o'clock, I wake up, this, I do this, I drink my coffee then, I do everything written down. And what would happen is a month or two months before, I would track everything that I do. And then you would have scores and everything. And what that meant is by the second exam period, I had a detailed track record of what I did when I fell asleep, when I, when I woke up, uh, what I did, what activities I did, to be able to perform. But I also had an, a, a tracker on how many days I needed to study for a specific exam to pass. So if I studied less than that, I wasn't sure if I was going to pass, which led to more stress. If I studied more than that, I would just be wasting time and just be like feeling, should I have studied or something like that? So unfortunately for me, that was 21 days. That meant for an exam, I needed to study 21 days consecutively. Which kind of brings me to that question that you asked, I think. Uh, when to say no to an exam, right? Well, for the exam. Well, for me, this scenario was the exam. I knew that 21 days was what I needed for an exam, which meant that if an exam was the next day, I had to say no to that exam. It was impossible for me, within what I tracked, to have a same head and still do both exams. So that's how I tracked, knowing that I would walk into that exam, have, still have stress on it, don't know. So you still have that factor which causes the fight or flight response and then the stress. But I minimized it based on that. And now that I actually go into a different career path where less uncertainty is happening, it's it's not as scary for me. I now know that if I walk into a speech, this is what I'll do. This is what I'll talk about and I know this because this has been my life for the last nine to ten years. So there's no stress. I just say hello, I talk to people, I do the speech. That's the beauty. So so with exams, I just track everything to know. And once I knew, stress felt minimized. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, because um, usually I do not make coping days about the percent but if I'm well prepared, I'm more stressed out than if I'm not well prepared. But then I'm like, oh, I'm going to make it anyway, then I'll be fine. Then I'm like, well, we'll find out how like piece of it or whatever. But when I'm well prepared, I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna be able to. I'm like less certain if I would be able to make the pass that time or not. The other way around for me. Why do you feel like that? Though? I don't know, but that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is it the uncertainty or something? It's just a physical burden if I just feel very. I don't know. Why? I, because first, that you think it's about the balance. But then how even I got a test and stuff, she was like, no, you're fine. And I'm just like, why are you going to be completely exhausted? And just like, when I walk out of the exam or afterwards, I'm perfectly fine. But before, I'm just like, oh my god, I'm going to die or something. And then you try tracking as to also, tracking means also like every day you write down how you feel and why you feel like that. That's also tracking. I don't know exactly. Maybe that could track your way why you feel like that. And then if you have like enough exam periods, you're able to deduce as to what's happening. And that's actually a very common thing that's happening right now with my clients. So so usually my clients nowadays, you can find them on whynotfree.com, it's like all videos and you know, but they're usually CEOs. And and what I actually tell them is like you can go to a psychologist. A psychologist is not like a weird thing. Their job, and many people don't understand that, they're like, oh no, I shouldn't go to a psychologist because I'm not crazy. So their job is not to analyze crazy people. Their job is to be able to listen to you and not answer weird like, answers. Sometimes you go to a friend and you have these super deep problems, and your friend is just like, uh, I don't know what to tell. 
So a psychologist is like a trained individual that can brainstorm with you. So maybe an idea is that you actually track and deduce things and then go to a psychologist and share your experience. And then the psychologist, because he's a trained individual, is able to ask you the right questions to come to a conclusion. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. That could be a solution. Maybe someone else that had the same experience as her found the solution. I mean, if you study so hard and then you fail, it's it's harder to cope with it than if you didn't fail that, then it really matter. If you pass, it's great. If you don't, well, it didn't study, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But if you did, then you have this extra burden of, I need to pass this because I studied for it, and if I if I already studied for it, then I won't be able to make it. It doesn't matter next time. So. Maybe a best friend that knows you really, really well and, and is smart enough to be able to you know, brainstorm with you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for it. Well. But again, a psychologist is not a bad thing. It's just a trained individual that you know, can guide you through the deduction and you know, get you to know yourself a bit better. Does that answer? Yeah. Have you suggested something that makes more people manage the stress? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, so uh, the thing is, so when I founded one on 3 it was to deal with the most extreme, extreme cases. What I found is that there's really a big gradation. So usually, most people don't fall in extreme cases. So when you're not in an extreme case, you can do things like exercise, breathing, meditation, it all helps. In the most extreme cases, those are the things that I deal with, and they, they help, I feel much better. Uh, and so the silent day was like, discovered for the most extreme cases. It was like the chronic hyperventilation fits. It was like I had clients that had rashes all over their body due to stress. Silent day fixed that. Uh, so, so that, silent day on a Sunday, or many silent days, which is pretty much meditation, um, throughout the days. The, the key figure though, so when you're asking for stress management, if you do any of these techniques that any of the world tells you to do, there are tons of apps. The key thing is not to do it once. The way you deal with stress is consistency, which is why Silent Day was so popular is because it only takes one day for you, instead of meditation, which you have to do for the rest of your life. Um, all of them work. But the reason why they work is not because of the technique. It's because of the thing that goes behind it, which is consistency. Because then your body recognizes that it's going to get released. It knows there's going to be a deep plug at the end of the week. When you do meditation every day, it knows it's coming. And so instead of doing meditation you know, once at 2 o'clock, once at 6 o'clock, you do it every day at the same time. So your body gets to know, your brain gets wired. Okay, we're super stressed out right now, but we're not going to break. Because at 8 o'clock, we're going to have our meditation. Or on Sunday, we're going to have our silent day. And then the funny thing is, once you wire your brain to think that way, when you don't take your break, it'll take the break for you. <laughs> so, so you've got to realize that we're, we're like organic computers. We're like organic patterns. You have to program and teach your brain that release is coming. So let's push a little bit through, which is kind of what you asked about overachieving, right? So, so you don't want to go completely over your limit. But if you do, you need to know that the break is coming. And as long as your body is programmed, our body is a very old computer. A very old computer takes time to learn and get programmed. Like you can't just upload a thing and then know Chinese. 
it takes a while. And just like learning a language, you'll have to teach your brain that you're going to take rest, which is why it takes two to three months. As long as you know your body acts that way, it becomes easier to start tinkering around biohacking your body. It's not like a crazy science. It's just we're a very easy computer. It's just hard in the sense that consistency is hard. So not many people want to take the time two, three months to program something into yourself. Which is why not many people speak a lot of languages. Because it takes a while to learn. So work-life balance is, is the reason it's hard is not because it's hard, it's because the discipline behind it, the consistency is the hard part. You figure that one out, you can become as successful as you want to be. Does that answer your question? Anything else about stress that I didn't answer? Then continue to know, which is your opinion. Thing. Have I answered this already or, or not? And so if not, then what was the context? What, what was the context again? It was more like I decided to not take a test, but also to be you're showing me for a test, so you decided yeah. not to go to a party or you decided okay. not to meet up with Yeah. So we can say yes to everything and then everybody. Yeah. So at some point you just have to say no. Yeah. For me there were two ways again, like by tracking I knew how much time I needed to invest and, and then I knew that, you know, the bit of the time I had to say no. But the principle behind it kind of comes back to this. You just you have three areas, you have the word buffer method, and once you know that, you start cutting out all the rest. So my shortcut there was the silent day, so then so then instead of like completely cutting people out, I would say, Hey, like I'll call you on Sunday. Like, I won't talk to you today. I'm not going to even make time for you today. I'll just call you on Sunday. And, and you start teaching people around you, just like you teach clients how to work with you, just like you teach your employees to work with you, your, your founders. Whoever deals with you, you got to teach them how you work. So many people, what they do is, for instance, uh, whenever people send people, like, I have friends, for instance, if you send them emails, you get an autoresponder, I will answer my email around 2 to 3 o'clock. That's the block where I do it. So everybody knows that at 2 to 3 o'clock, those emails get answered. So here, that person is teaching anybody that sends them emails that he's just not going to respond no matter what happens. Maybe an emergency, but then, you know, there's an assistant who gets through and so on. So, so. Being able to say no can sometimes be less vicious than you think. If you just explain your goals to the people that care about you or the people that want to get in touch with you, usually people are quite understanding. We are, from the way I see the world, very positive and we want to help people. So people don't want to burn out other people. If they do, they shouldn't be around you in the first place. But you, ne you never see someone deliberately pushing you to the point where you have to go to the hospital or something like that. So when you just explain to them, hey, these are my goals, I hope you understand, but I have time on Sunday, it becomes much easier to say no. But in order to do that, you need to know your goals, how much you're focusing on. That's fine, right, or that you find the work. Yeah. But then also not cutting people viciously out, still leaving a small shortcuts so that you don't think that anything else else and that's the issue that we found else it's not maintainable so so the the problem is that if you have this success coach she'll tell you to cut things out completely what happens is six months 12 months down the line these people revert back to the old self and the reason why they did that is because they didn't like the viciousness of how much it is it's it's very hard to say no to everybody but so, so be human, you know, have a balance. Realize that you can't maintain craziness for a long time. And, and so give yourself, just like fitness guys give cheat days. I don't really do cheat days, but like, you know, they do cheat days for a specific reason. We can't live with craziness for a long time. Also, we revert back to our old self. So as long as you have, you know, a cheat day to give priority to other people than your goals, you might maintain that for you know, nine to ten years. Can I ask for your question? Anybody else about this? Okay, so procrastination. I think that was you. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, uh, context again? Um, like, you know, uh, to study for an exam and something we don't like. So we uh, do other things to put it off. Yeah, I'm not going to give you a nice answer here, okay. though. So um, I really went deep into procrastination. Every workshop that I found, that was the question. And so you start diving deep into this, just like you learn in law. And, and there's so many explanations. But the one that I found that was kind of universal behind it is, so usually, if you really reflect really deep about it, there are many tools. I'll tell you the tools in a bit. But first, like what I discovered, the principle behind it was, usually you're not as passionate about it as, as you might say to yourself. So for me, that was a hard discovery, because I love the law. Watching suits, thinking, oh my god, that's going to be my career. Like, that was cool. I studied corporate law, scored really good grades, and I was just like really happy about it. But I did score great grades. But the studying was horrible. I procrastinated so much. I think I watched the whole of the internet during my student time. It's just TV shows after TV shows, and then saying, after this 20 minute TV show, I'll do this chapter. And that was like how I studied. And so after you know, years of studying, I started realizing what I actually knew all along, but was lying to myself. And the reason I was lying to myself is because I needed a career. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to be a corporate lawyer, so I was going to study law. And I forced myself to study law to the point where you know, I got sick and I had to figure all of this stuff out. And I realized at the end, my, my second to last year, I realized that I didn't want to be a lawyer. And it was a very hard realization. And the moment I realized that, it got even worse the procrastination. I just studied to get that piece of paper. And it was, it was a very bad year, but I got through it. Uh, and the way I got through it is obviously a lot of tools beat procrastination. Um, so, so once you understand the principle, you need to really reflect as to the path you choose in your life. So whenever people tell you you cannot make money with your passion, that is not true. You can make money with your passion. You just have to have a mindset and know how to monetize it. So, so first of all, don't be afraid to say no to specific things and walk a different career. Okay, once you figure that one out and you're like, okay, I don't want to walk a different career, I just want to do this. Cool, you're pushing yourself, it can be very unhealthy. There are some manageable tricks to that. One of the things that's getting the most kind of you know rounds and is very popular is the Pomodoro technique. 25 minutes where you just like go really forced, you take a five minute break, 25 minutes, four rounds, then you take a long break. Pomodoro has gotten a lot of cred, it deserves it. Um, uh, the beauty of Pomodoro is that it becomes like an exercise. You're training your focus to the point where I had, uh, I, I saw people in my workshop that studied medicine. They were able to do 50 minute things. Um, there are a lot of vitamin stacks that you can, you know, take vitamins on top of each other. So it's still healthy. It's not like smart drugs. It's just still the healthy stuff. So B complex is energy. So you can check out your levels when you do your blood test and how your B complex is. If it's a little bit low, it might be that you know you should have some B complex. Uh, so all those energy drinks, they always promote how much vitamin B they have. So that outside of the B, they also have other stuff that you shouldn't drink. So you can just take straight up B complex if your levels are low, and then that will give you a little bit of energy. Caffeine in the purest form without all the bad coffee beans. Like, they're truly hard to find really good coffee beans. But if you find them, you have an amazing coffee and great energy. But easier is just to get straight up caffeine from the pharmacy. So then you lose caffeine. Caffeine scientifically has been proven to be actually healthy uh, for our brain. Uh, the feet, like, slow down Alzheimer's and stuff like that. Uh, it's actually a little bit classified as a smart drug, uh, a neuroreceptor. Um, so these are, and you can Google them, and you'll get a list of all the biohacking tools to boost your brain. There are things, what, what I used to do is creatine, which is still a vitamin, it's not a drug, uh, but it boosts your metabolism, makes you recover faster from sessions. So it's not only for the gym, it says it's been proven to also boost, you know, intelligence a little bit. 
although again, it's not completely conclusive there. But for me, when, when I tested it out, um, well, you start peeing a lot more, so that's one side effect. But you do notice that you know you don't get as tired, you recover faster. So it helps with that. It helps you. So for me, practically what creatine did is I was able to actually go to the gym and wind down, and then not feel you know muscle ache at the end. It would recover me faster. I would be able to recover from my study sessions a bit faster as well. So combine all of those tricks together, Pomodoro, you know, new, uh, you know, vitamin stacks, caffeine in a healthy form and not bad stuff, food on a very healthy form. Like imagine, and most of you do this during exams already, you stop eating pizzas and stuff. I mean, sometimes you break down, you're finished, you're able to eat a pizza. But you know that if you eat that pizza, you're not going to perform as well. So healthy food combined with all of that, it just it boosts to your limits, and that's the limit you're going to hit. And then if you want to break through that limit, that's all passion. You've got to be passionate about what you do, else you're not. Else you're just pushing that limit, which is what I did, and then I got sick. So I'm not sure if you like that answer, though. Yeah, sure. Because I know about myself. I don't like all the subjects of law, but there are some I am passionate about, so I can do that right now. Sometimes I, I think I don't like it, but when I read the stuff and I'm like, oh, I get it. So then I start to like it. But if, yeah, exactly. If you but know the, the principle. The thing for me is it's hard to start. Yeah, but the start I can also explain. But what the most important part is I always explain the principle behind it. So once you know how the principle works, you can pull your brain. So like you can make the connection. For me, the connection to corporate law was suits. So then you get passionate about it. So, so maybe you don't like penal law, so you still make a connection. And then you're like, hey, this is actually fun. Right? You, you start fooling your brain a little bit. It won't hold you for long, but maybe long enough. Uh, as for starting, uh, so I read a book. I think it's called The Skinny Book on Time Management or something like that. It's a very fast book. You can read it in an hour. I really like it. Um, and what he said in there kind of like helped me with that whole procrastination. Uh, he has like a small chapter in there and he explains the way procrastination works is like an, like an object. If there's no force applied to it, it doesn't move. But if you start applying force to it, then it's it a bit harder force, but then it becomes easier and easier, so then it starts just rolling. So what you need to do is you need to pull your brain to make it like a small exercise out of it. You'll say something like, and maybe you've done this before where you're saying, well, most of us do this with games. So we say, hey, we'll just take five minutes on this game. And then you start and then two hours go by. So, so the same goes with boring stuff. You'll say to your brain, hey, let will just do this one, one or two sentences or one or two paragraphs. And then before you know it, the chapter is done. So but, but you force your brain to just do the first two paragraphs. And that's why what I, the way I did it is like I would watch a 20-minute TV show and then start. And then it kind of boosts me through the chapter. And yeah, so what I would do also is like pause the TV show and then it says, okay, let me like do these paragraphs and then like, you know, I'll continue the show. So that's like how I would use that principle. I kind of explain it? Yeah. That's how it worked for me. I hope it works for you as well, like that immovable object. Yeah. A lot of self experimentation. It's necessary for work life balance. This will work for me, might not work for you. But the idea is that I explain the principle behind it and you find a way to kind of find your way to the principle. Is this explained this uh, thing in procrastination? Okay, outperform. I think that was you can explain this. Uh, so outperform in a way that for like exams, uh, get once you get applied to principles. Like a, a habit tra tracking or all those kind of things, but then you get a good grade. That's okay, but you want, you want to outperform sometimes. For example, if you want to go to a big law firm, you can't just go with sevens, or you, you want to outperform. I know people that do Or in any other case, or the gym, or no, I whatever. Uh, well, what you're actually asking here is how can you become the best? Yeah. Am I clear? So, so the way you become the best from my experience uh, is by not having mentors that are mediocre. 
So, so when I had to learn how to become social, I didn't learn from my friends. I looked up who the best was, and I flew out to the States to meet this guy. And I would absorb him for three days long. Um, in health, my instinct wasn't to go to the doctor. I would go to the doctor and ask him a couple questions. But a doctor, I know it's a little bit offensive, but that's mediocrity. A doctor that earns less than 100 k a year, I mean, that guy isn't going to, if by some accident this guy's not like, you know, super passionate about his craft and just like wanted to help people like as a normal doctor, those are rare, but they exist. But my experience was those people are mediocre. So those aren't the people you're going to talk about biohacking. Who you are going to talk about biohacking are those people that speak everywhere. Uh, sharing a specific message. So there are doctors, they don't speak everywhere, but they speak on specific conferences. It's like, so you have this hype about these people that know fitness really well and they speak on every conference. Those aren't the best. The best is the doctor that's like a surgeon somewhere, first, first, you know, emergency kind of person, studied at Harvard, publishes papers on specific things. They have specific conferences they go to. And by some lucky chance, two years ago, I got an accreditation to be able to enter those conferences. That's how I would meet those people. And there I asked them questions. How do you do this? How do you do that? How did you discover which food is bad for you? Are there specific tests that personalize diets for you? That's what I figured out. With, with social, saying, like, absorb this guy for three days, see how he talks to people, watch everything he has online, and then actually ask him the questions, okay, what did you just do there? Things that I discovered was, when you're with four people, very social dynamic thing, right? So when you're with four people, it's, it's just a conversation, but the moment somebody enters, notice this, like you'll be talking at a party or at a crowd. So, so four people is a conversation, everybody can get, get to talking. The moment somebody enters, it becomes a speech. And what a speech is, is this kind of situation. One person talks, everybody listens. But if that doesn't happen, then the group splits up, three and two. Every time I would notice this happening, he was right. So this gives really good context when you know social dynamics, right? You're doing sales, you see a big CEO guy. You know he's in a group of four people. You know that if you're going to enter that group, and he's here, you're not going to be entering from here, because the group will split up into three and two. So you're going to be stuck with these people, and the CEO is here. So you enter the group from here, so you can be with the CEO guy. So, so these kind of small things, you know, you start absorbing. You start absorbing the best that you're not going to become the best right away, but, you know, decade long, only the best around you, your, your things are going to raise. Same with this whole law firm. I mean, imagine you had a partner at one of the biggest law firms ever that you just talk to over dinner. There's a big chance you'll end up in a good law firm, even if your grades aren't great, because you're modeling the best. But here is also one thing that is the great advice that I got, uh, which is usually we tend to model the best. So the issue with that, I don't know if anybody knows the issue with that. So why can't I just like, if I want to become a great basketball player, just model Michael Jordan, you know, just check out his schedule and just do exactly what he does. He, um, imagine I have the talent, but I'm just like, you know, my belly and the issue is that if I start, you know, popping pills like he does and exercising six hours a day and my body's not prepped, I'm not going to be able to do that. It's just impossible to jump into that. But what you can do is model the guy right in front of you. So when I said the best, I would look the people up within my price range that were the best. I can't afford Michael Jordan, but I could afford a guy that's not super cheap but he's well recognized within the area. Absorb everything I could from him, move on to the next, and so on and so on. But, but very focused. But only go to the next once I felt like I outgrew this person. And the reason I felt that way is because we got into a situation and I handled it better than that person would. That's how I knew to move on. If it would happen like two or three times, I would move on.
the best situation you can get in is to find a mentor that grows as fast as you, which is why the team that I hire are all overachievers, and they all grow super fast. The worst thing I can do is slow down how fast I grow because they'll catch up, get bored, and move on. So my objective within my company is to grow faster than them so that they can keep being interested. So that's how I handle the outperform. Okay, so really mentors to, to outperform, but how do you uh, how do you instigate it? How do you start it to outperform? Of course you can this is the way to do it. Yeah. Every industry is different, but that person will tell you. So you need to give me a specific industry and I'll tell you like if I have that experience how I would handle it or if I have a friend if I don't have experience I'll, I'll tell you to find a mentor there and we'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. There's always a specific step by step and that person will be able to tell you. So within business I can tell you what I learned, how to outperform there. So I'm in the creative industry, right? The film industry. Everybody's a creative person. Nobody likes um, you know, giving with a business mindset within the videos. So you will not find a video agency that gives unlimited feedback. You just you won't find it. It's also like very not very smart to give that. It takes a lot of hours. You need a big team to be able to handle unlimited feedback. But one way to already outperform them is you know give unlimited feedback. So you need to find that unlimited Tip within your industry. So somebody that graduated summa cum laude at Harvard, right? So, so I had professors at my university that did that. Then I would just talk to them. So how did you do that? What are your tips? What are your techniques? How did you deal with procrastination? Those kind of things. Um, that's where I learned from Odoro. That's where I learned about passion, how to link, how to you know program your brain. These are tools. You're asking me about tools. How can you find tools? And the best way to find tools is to find the best person in that industry and ask them, what are your tools? Experiment. Cut out the things that don't work for you. Go to the next one. Cut out the things that don't work for you. And then you grow your own tool. Which is why I explain the principle behind it. So that for instance, you can go experiment and find your own tool. Here. And I'll give you some, not just with this, is my tool. Here. But that's what outperforms. You want the best law firm? Go to the senior partners. You know, I'm a student interviewing for some press or whatever. How do you hire? Like, what does it take to be at your law firm? And how did you get in? And you'll find a common denominator that everybody did. And you'll go and do that. But, of course, mentors, that's, that's a really big thing. Uh, yeah. I believe, I believe so. But there also needs to be a, a internal motivation to, to, okay. to outperform. Oh, like that. Um, of course, I this, used is to, a, this is the way, but yes. how, how? Well, the internal motivation comes from passion. So I used to think that everybody wants to be the best. And what I found is that not everybody wants to be the best. Some people like mediocrity, and you should be fine with that. That's their happiness. That's their activity. So it's fine, but if so, so what that means is, for instance, and that's how people recruit people as well. Like they're looking for that little bit extra, and if that little bit extra isn't there, you might not manage in a big law firm, for instance. So, so sometimes mediocrity is fine. Actual overachievers, how that happens? Well, usually it's some issue in their past. But most probably, it's passion in a specific area. So once you find that area, it becomes really easy. That it, and, and you might have already experienced it. Every time you have flow, so flow is a natural scientific term where you get into flow, you just get absorbed. Sometimes you forget to eat. Once you get into flow, that is an indication that you're following your passion. If you can get into flow, and you're passionate about it, and you can make that your job, you'll automatically be an outperformer, an overachiever. So, so the goal of how to become that is not becoming that. It's finding where you naturally are an overachiever and focusing down on that. And staying away from everything else where you're not an overachiever. Because if you go and overachieve in those areas, you will burn out. And unfortunately, that's kind of the sad truth. And the numbers don't lie. So that is kind of my take on overachievers. 
the overachiever that's passionate about the law, that loves corporate law and just can absorb for hours, goes back on homes and watches like Stanford lectures or Erasmus lectures about law and you know tips and tricks and whatever. Like that guy compared to a guy that wants to work at the best firm and then this guy will burn out after five years, this guy 20 years later is a senior partner. Because this guy is in it forever. This guy is in it for you know for the cred. Yeah, yeah. That's the difference. Does that kind of answer your question? No, no, very, very helpful. So those were all areas. I don't know if we still have time. It's more than an hour already. I think what did we do? Whatever. Whatever. Do you have questions towards me? It's been quite, you know. Is it practical enough? Is it like what's going on in your mind? What um, are your favorite self-help books? Because you always have this case of management. Why not? Is that the book? Yeah, so it's coming out in a couple of months. So make sure to go to whynotbook.com. Uh, but no, uh, practically. I love everything that Tim Ferriss puts out. Tim Ferriss was one of the few people I trusted in the beginning in this journey. There weren't a lot of people online. Uh, so the reason I liked Tim Ferriss is because he was publishing his results. So I could take my own conclusions. Sometimes I didn't agree with him. Sometimes I did. And I would just be able to look at his results. He was the reason I didn't have to have a needle in my arm every week, but only once a month or every three months. So I like everything Tim Ferriss puts out. He has these big books now that he puts out called, uh, so the last one we gave uh, at an event we threw, Tools of Titans. It's an like 800 page book. But the beauty is that it's, it's based on his podcast. So he has chapters of those interviews, of these, these two hour interviews with people, and he takes the best thing and he writes it down in like four pages. So you have pretty much 200 people, the best people he could ever get on his podcast in a book. And so that's what I think is great. Simon Sinek is the guy that led me, you know, the Golden Circle guy. He's the guy that led me to understand how procrastination actually worked. Because his why circle explained why I wouldn't be able to, why I was pushing myself to study the law. And then outside of everything, we also uh, have, because this question pops up a lot, so we created a link, whynotbe.com forward slash output workshop. And there I have a list that goes from A to Z, all the books that I recommend. There's a lot of people ask me, but Simon Sinek, Tim Ferriss. Uh, I like Dave Asprey. So there's a lot of things that he says that I don't agree with. Again, the reason I do like him, he publishes his results and gives me an opportunity to compare. He has a list of things that are good and bad for you food-wise. Half of those things, so I have a personal, so we were certified a year ago by the Alcat Laboratories, that's a test that takes your blood, goes through a lab, and they test how your immune system reacts to certain foods. So based on that test, I could see that the way I react on foods is a little bit different than Dave Asprey. But you know the beauty is that I can actually compare to the published results. So so that's why I like him. So up to your research when you read these people. Um, and there's a ton more. Type in biohacking, you'll see. List. Uh, I like Mark Sisson from Mark's Daily Apple. The reason why is he's like 60 something, almost 70 years old, I think, or maybe like 50. I don't know, he looks like he's 30 years old. It's crazy. So that's why I like him. <laughs> he looks like he's super young. And the release date of your book is? So I can include it on the list. Uh, right now it's 2018. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, it still has to go through the publishers, editors, uh, so it does I think probably, probably like summer period or something like that. How many books do you read? Not that many. Thank God after a lot of that. <laughs> down. But I have an account on Audible now, so I'm I listen to them. Um, yeah, I listen to them. But the bigger the team grows, the less I have opportunities. But with the blood test, you do that every month. In the beginning, yeah, because what I did is I switched from carb based to high fat. And that's a really scary step, because if you do that wrong, you can actually have a heart attack because you're cluttering up your blood, right. uh, your heart, 
head and your heart's pumping your blood and so that can have a problem. So, so you need to switch to the good fats. And the way you check that is like cholesterol levels. If they're too high, like that means you're clogging it up, you can have a heart attack. So I actually did it wrong the first week. So my cholesterol level was like really bad and my doctors are really worried and invited me the next week again. And I realized why, because I was eating the wrong fats. Changed the fats, came back the next week, and it was like the other way. My cholesterol, the good cholesterol was like super good suddenly, and the bad was like super low. So it's funny how fast the effect goes. What so, was the bad fat? Uh, yeah, so, so butter, normal butter, and like albacan or something, like you won't find in the albacan a good butter. Just all of it is bad. Uh, the reason why it's bad is because uh, it comes from cows that aren't grass fed. So cows naturally should be eating grass. What they actually eat, uh, so I, when I moved to the Netherlands, I actually called every farmer that was from other ten and was producing to other ten. And I actually found out what they feed their cows. And so usually it's grain-based stuff, so gluten-based. Cows shouldn't be eating that. Cows should be eating grass. So the only, only real butter that you can get from grass fed cows are usually cows either from New Zealand and Ireland. And why only those two places in the, in the entire world? Because only those two places have too much grass in such an amount that giving grain to cows is actually more expensive. Which is why farmers automatically give grass to cows. So their butter for meat is usually much healthier and, and results into much better cholesterol. And if you then eat, you know, bad butter uh, from, from eggs from bad chicken, whatever, you end up bad cholesterol. Which is why uh, fat got a bad cred in the beginning of the 80s or 90s, because people were eating you know, bad fats and the cholesterol got all weird. Had they been eating good fats, they wouldn't have been like that. No, nuts is uh, protein. Salmon is fat. But salmon, here's the beauty of salmon. Uh, I met a guy in New York who's in charge of the Scandinavian export of fish stuff, whatever. Uh, so what happened there, and that was later also published, so it was funny, I met that guy there. Um, so if, if you've ever been to Norway, you will know this is real. So all the factories dump their stuff in the water. So every omega-3 pill that you get, or salmon, or whatever fish industry that comes from Norway, and you can see it on the color of the fish, is usually quite unhealthy. And if you ever, you, know, you can go to Albert Hen and compare Scottish wild caught salmon, or even, and this one is way better, Alaskan caught salmon, compare it to the Norway salmon. And you'll see this one is light pink, and this one is dark red almost. And, and you can already see then that this one had a much healthier life because why would your salmon be light pink if... And sometimes what they use, they even put coloring into it, you know, to boost it, whereas the wild caught one doesn't need that. So, and they do the same with butter. They make it yellow, where actually the color is white. Imagine your butter should be yellow, and it's actually white. What do they actually do to the cows like, to get it to that point? If you ever go to a farmer, you show him an egg from like the store, and he sees that it's yellow. And a friend, a farmer, but she, you know, looked at the egg, and you can see when it's yellow, it's unhealthy. A normal good egg should be hard, and it should be dark orange. That's how you know an egg is good. And and you can ask if you have friends that were in the country that had chickens, they'll know dark red is a good kind of color. Yellow is bad. And that means that the animal that produced that wasn't that healthy. And if it wasn't healthy, you're going to eat all of that stuff that went through that animal. And that goes into your cholesterol, goes to sickness. And there's a lot of diseases linked to that, and a lot of papers around that, things like arthritis, IBS, um, the list goes on. Do so you have this as a blood test? Do you have results? Yeah. What's, how, what do you do with the results? How do you then? Oh, the beauty, yeah, the beauty of what the doctors do here nowadays is like they have the average next to it. So you have your results and next to it like the average of the population. So if you're below the average, that's an indication for you that you should be talking about. Do the doctor give you advice to change it? To do certain things? No, so that's why I say usually doctors are mediocre, they don't understand. 
for them, they're like, this is good enough. And if I would listen to their advice, then I would still be, I was always sick. Always like every two months I would get sick. Always taking naps for 10, 11 hours. So for them, I was healthy. I wasn't healthy at all. So you experimented on your health routine. Yeah, that's how I figured out like magnesium was too low for me. Supplementing with magnesium improved my sleep. Because I saw in my blood levels I was under average. And then when I supplemented, the sleep got better out of them. No, uh, there are bad research around bananas. I stopped okay. eating this. I forgot the guy around it uh, who published it. He's super, the super pro vegan guy, a very, very established doctor. I forgot his name. Uh, if you type in like vegan, vegan doctor or something, you'll try to find it. But there's bad stuff around bananas. I don't know what. I'm not a doctor. Why not use a platform where we refer to things? But magnesium, you'll find. Fish. Uh, I think so. Where is that at that? Sorry. Uh, you can type because Google. I was taking supplements for my I had straight supplements, yeah. Uh, or because magnesium is one of those vitamins that can be absorbed by the skin. So you can also have it and, and you'll have it now in the in the pharmacy shampoos. Uh, and sometimes now in normal brands as well, you'll find magnesium so so then you can just wash yourself with magnesium. Yeah, in some extent as well. Uh, very small. That's like a good kind of water. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You have to Google that stuff. Yeah. I Google all of that stuff. <laughs> Any other questions? Last time on TV. supposed to be a lawyer. And 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 in practical practical terms, because I like practicality, the moment I realized that that wasn't the career path for me, um, if I didn't have to sacrifice something. So I didn't sacrifice becoming rich. I took another career path that gave me more money. And and realizing that, you know, my I had such a fear of not having enough money. Because if I fail, there is not like a family to you know fall down on. For me it was literally like make this work or go live under a bridge. That was like my mindset. So so it was very scary to realize I wasn't supposed to be a lawyer. But when I did, it was like the world changed. It became this crazy experience that I've been having for the last four years, traveling like around the world, doing crazy talks. It's just like one big. The way I compare it is like I was in a student organization. Uh, I said when we had these conferences every month. For me, it's just be one big student organization traveling around the world. That's my company. The way I recruit people is I have I'm recruiting friends. It's a very vicious process to get into my company. It takes three weeks. But what I'm testing is, I'm testing potential people that I could become best friends with. And so, so people you see there, these are people that if I couldn't see myself becoming friends with them, I wouldn't get through it. So to, to be in a, in a life where suddenly I get to pick and choose as many friends as I get here, <coughs> And, and are, I'm able to actually make it their job to, you know, be with me, experience my crazy lifestyle, and you know, enjoy our lives. Today we we like we were working right, and then one of our interns came back from Guardians uh, Infinity War. He came out last night, three three thirty a.m. He like texts on WhatsApp because he was at the premiere, so he was like, it was so worth it. And then in the morning he's just talking about you know Infinity War. Oh my God, it's so great. So I just say, okay, well, there's a show at two o'clock. Let's go. And so, till so like before an hour ago, I was just at, at Infinity War. That was my job. That was team building. 
I go to my accountant and I say, hey, this is this is Steamboat. So and, and because we're a film company, it's also market research. So and it's true because we actually look at those movies and then we implement them to our movies. That's my life. And that's just it's ridiculous to understand that you are able to get an idea and make it your life. And when you start realizing that that's possible, other career paths open up to you. And so you get to look at your life and actually ask yourself, is this what I really want to do? And if you can answer that question, and that answer is become a lawyer, then you know you're going to be passionate and you're going to be great for the rest of your life. But if it's not, it can lead to a path of unhappiness, to, to burnouts, and problems down the line. So my biggest tip is know who you are. That's what that always meant for me. Know that there are other stuff. Know who you are is a mindset that you can only have when you have abundance. When you're in scarcity, oh, I can only do this, you will make that choice. If you're in abundance and can be whatever you want to be, then suddenly you know, that choice becomes more of a passion. So yeah, that's kind of the tip I can. And then, obviously, practical tips study hard to get your diploma. <laughs> yeah, that's actually also there. Whenever you follow your passions, there are people that are going to say like, "Oh, why are you still studying?" No, study, finish your diplomas. It's going to be a difference in entrepreneurship. I can see the difference, and like, it's actually like a thing. Like when I walk around with people that have a degree, you can spot them. It's a completely different conversation. Uh, Having a degree, especially a law degree, opens up your mind so much more. It makes you think differently, explore much more. And outside of everything, you know, you still have that piece of paper. It's not as stressful as you might think. Obviously, you'll never need it as an entrepreneur, but for yourself, it's a sense of accomplishment. Because you're going to go through ups and downs, no matter if you're an entrepreneur or a different job, ups and downs. And at least that way, you've accomplished something great. Something that you know a select few only get to do. Even though everybody does it, it's not everybody. It's a select few that get through. So yeah, definitely graduate. <laughs> but uh, I'm interested. Uh, you, uh, you said you have a lot of clients that are CEOs. For example, uh, I come with a problem. I say uh, I'm having a big deal uh, coming up, and I don't know. Uh, yeah, usually they don't come in for that stuff. Um, the business part is easily handled. So one of the things, like one of the guys, you can see him on WhyNotFigo.com, came in is he restarted his business and he usually came, he came from a fallout that he had with his co-founders before. So, so one of the things we worked on is to establish a business, you know, the way I built out, the way you can go enjoy your life and that's your business. So it was, so it's for, for me, what I do for them is just like a bridge. I just like here, I just tell you it's possible. That's all I do for them. So I told them like, this is possible. Why don't you do this? And for them, it's usually just like, oh, I can do this? Cool. And they just do it because they, they're more skillful than me. So for them, it's usually like that realization. And once the realization is there, they just do it. I can help them, but usually they're more skillful than me. So they can just do it. Also, you the thoughts. I connect the dots, and usually I connect the dots between health, wealth, and relationships. So what I tell them is, okay, so you've done all of this in business, right? You did recruitment for, you know, your team, and this team is all your friends now, right? And you live your life with them. How about you do the same for relationships? You know, you find yourself a girlfriend, and you do like, you know, a proper recruitment. It's instead of like jumping with somebody, you know, marrying this person and divorcing, how about you actually ask this person some questions? Do a recruitment internally. So I just connect the dots for things they already know. That's my job now. It's a charity thing that I do. But I take on a specific amount of clients. These clients donate to the community, which keeps us running. Um, and I have my main job to actually focus on and grow in. And this is you know where I give back. So I'm about to know your skill, right? Well, again, so get out of scarcity and abundance. What that means is you know, sit in front of the mirror and then look in the mirror. 
and ask yourself, do I really want to do what I'm going to do? And, and that's, you know, Steve Jobs is popular saying that, where it's like, if I was going to die tomorrow, was I going to do what I'm going to do tomorrow? And if the answer is no, you shouldn't do it. Well, that's not completely true, but the idea behind it is, are you going to path that you truly want to do if you had abundance in your life? And if the answer is no, you go into self-reflection. And there you have exercises where you establish your health, wealth, and relationships, and you look, what do, what do I want to improve in my health? How do I do it? If you don't know how Google is. Uh, that's the beauty of the 21st century. Everything is on Google. The how is on Google. This is not on Google. Realizing your health, wealth, and relationships. And what you want to improve in health is up to you. Your body, your mind, it's up to you. How you do it? Google. Well, same thing. You don't have enough money, you know, you can go on Google to take the first steps. You don't know how. Like, if you really can't find it on Google, then, you know, you go get a sales job. They'll teach you there. Uh, health. You don't know how to improve health? Get, you know, become, go to a gym. That'll get you started. Get to talking mentors, talking to people in those areas. And, and what happens is, if you do a lot, you suddenly start realizing, you know, what you actually want to do. And, and so in the beginning, and that's how I teach my team, in the beginning I tell them, say yes to everything. Take one year to everything that pops up, say yes. And once you're at your limit and you're about to burn out, that's when you come to me and I'll tell you to say no. But till then, you keep saying yes. And, and the two people have been doing it in the team and their lives have been completely different in a couple months. You say yes to everything. That's how I started. And then you'll start finding out what you don't like. And what you don't like will push you towards things that you do like, which will push you to more things that you like. And then eventually you look in the mirror and you're like, I have so many skills. I'm in abundance. What do I want to do with my life? And that's when you start that path of self exploration. Does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. So you make you should make decisions uh, out of abundance. So always, always prepare to get the best. Always, no abundance means if I had so much money, would I be doing this? In health, if I had the perfect body, you know, or if I'm like perfectly healthy. You know, would I be eating this? Those kind of things. It's like abundance. It's like so for for me, it was never about the perfect body. For me, it was about knowing why I'm tired, why I sleep so much. It was about balance. I needed to be happy. If eating a muffin makes me happy that day, you know, I'll eat it. Uh, for me, it was about knowing that if I eat that muffin, what will happen to me? how long I'll be tired, and how I can compensate for that. So if it goes really bad, like if I eat like a really glutinous pizza, I'll be really sick. How do I compensate for that? And there's a thing called activated charcoal. You take that, it takes you know, the bad stuff away so that I don't you know, throw up all night or something like that. For me, it was that. That was my happiness, knowing what was happening with me. Because for years, doctors couldn't tell me. My thing is balance. For some people, it could be the ultimate perfect body, you know? And then for them, the happiness is not eating a muffin. So that's abundance. I know that I want to know. I know that I want to be balanced. Can I eat a muffin? Yeah, sure. That goes what I stand for. I don't stand for perfection. On purpose. Because I want that muffin. Or someone that once said, you should enjoy life a little bit. It's not always about freedom. You should have time as well. A relationship. And then every, every side is an inner and an outer component. So health, inner is mind, you know, soul. Outer is body, everything you see. Relationships, inner is you love yourself. Outer is 
people around you. And then um, wealth is outside, all the money you have, all the possessions you have. Inside is how rich is your mind. Uh, how many languages you speak, how many books you read, what kind of experiences you have. That's why a lot of people go like a year to Australia or something. What they're actually feeding there is uh, inner wealth. They come back, they don't have money, their relationships have watered down, and their health is usually quite bad. So you, I mean, you successfully work on one sixth of your life when you go to Australia for a year. So it's progress, it's just not progress that I aim for. But uh, it's still so it's a Yeah. You can still take those experiences. And at the same time in Australia, you know, you work on your health, make more long lasting friends that you can also use, that you can also have and enjoy back at home, so that you're, you're actually making progress in that life. Yeah, oh, so the. Yeah, in the theory, yeah. yeah, in theory, so the theory goes again, like I already said, that if you want to achieve the money, you have to do it every day, consistently, have that activity until you achieve the state of the money. Then there's the next level, which I won't go deeper into it right now, but if you achieve the money, I think my job is very successful. Try it out for two months, every day, helpful relationships, and then after two months, look to yourself in the mirror and See where you're at. But the love this is super <laughs> I find it super weird that people don't even do a yearly blood test. Like, maybe you have SCDs. I mean, how do you know? I do that every two months. Yeah, for me, it's super oh, normal that you. I do that every two months. Yeah, but a lot of people don't, and they find it super weird. <laughs> but did you notice a, a huge difference between when you did the right thing? Oh no, so before uh, my results were usually lower than average. That's why I was like, always say, always say the thing. And so I thought that was normal. The doctor would say, oh, you're fine, because you're in the range of where everything's fine. Um, so I was like, oh, the doctor knows stuff. And then when I started digging deeper, I started realizing that what doctors know is what they learned 20 years ago in medicine school. But what happens is new papers come out. And usually the mediocre doctors, like they work, I mean imagine, you work pretty hard, 9 to 5, you get home, you just want to watch Netflix. Like not everybody's a crazy, you know, entrepreneur that, you know, reads and works all the time. You know, they just want to get home and watch Netflix. You need the crazy people to actually read those papers. There's so many papers that come up. So, so a doctor in the office knows stuff that is being taught to him 20 years ago. And that's the, not the doctor you want. You want the doctor that actually reads medical journals, that knows the latest things, that if you bring up, hey, my magnesium levels are low, what do I do? And then he's like, 10 different things come at you. And he's like, oh, I read in this paper. That's, really, that's the guy you want. So I don't know what your question is. Sorry. Uh, oh, no, I'm just curious just about the, the, the blood test. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I had a I had a doctor who, who like that's why I have this like love hate relationship. Uh, so when I first started this journey, like this doctor, uh, he said I was going to have a heart attack if I switched to to you know that's the fat. Um, and what happened is so I actually came back the next week and we saw the results and it was like double healthy than normal. And it was just a week. It was really weird. And she looked at the results, and I, and I literally said to her, so what do you think about this? And she's like, yeah, well, I don't know. Like, you still should stop. <laughs> and I fired her after. I went to a different doctor. So when, when somebody says that, then you're like, seriously? It's like, there, it's a number. Like, you can't even lie to this number. It's like, yeah, you still should stop, because they're stuck in their old book. If someone comes to me with it one country and says, you, you talked crap about this. I have you know, this paper with numbers and everything, and the research is really sound. Like, clearly you're wrong, or like, you should do this differently. I mean, I'd be like, whoa, this is interesting. 
And then in the next workshop, I can talk about this one. Uh, that's why throughout the workshop, I was saying, hey, this is like not very scientific, but it works for some people. This is like scientific. I tested it and tested it with other people. Science, science is like real, like real about, around this. It's like the last two years, people coming up to me like, hey, have you checked out this? Hey, have you checked out this? And then I noticed that like um, the women people in my crowd, like women are like more prone to like other kind of trackers. Like the guys love the happy cheat, but then the women love things like the productivity planner. So I started including the productivity planner as a tip, you know, a book where you write stuff down, like a tracker. So yeah, you listen to just cool. Yeah. Someone has the last question for what we done. Do you have a